Calvary Temple Church. You are Calvary Temple Church, the people of God. It's so great to be able to meet together uh, in the name of the Lord and worship the Lord together. Um, some people are joining us in person today, some are on the live stream, uh, joining us online as well. And so we're so glad that you're all able to get out. We got here safe amidst the slightly slippery conditions there earlier this morning. Forecasted sun, we got coming out and it was heavy snow. And I thought, oh no, this is not what we want. But it looks like the sun's coming out, so we're getting there. This morning as we start, we want to give you a report on our MAC uh, missions contest. Uh, MAC, M-A-K stands for Me and Kenza, right? Right, Kenza? No, that's not it. It stands for Missions and Kids. Missions and Kids. It's a project that we do normally. We promote this the first Sunday of the month. Uh, but we want to give you a report from year end to end of 2023 now that we have the data for that. So the project is this. Uh, it's the BAM Project Bricks and Mortar in Jakar, Senegal, Africa. We are partnering with the uh, Pennies, uh, folks that we, Pastor Andrea probably know a little bit about from the Penny family at Glad Tidings, her home church in Moncton. They work in Senegal. They were here. How long were they here? Yes, they were here about a year ago. You're right, Pastor Laura. And they shared about their ministry and the work that they're doing. They're building restoration centers for street children in Turkana. Everything feels like yesterday, so I don't know. Right now, my mind is about in July 2023. That's, I'm waiting for the a beach day, so you know I can relate to that. Uh, so it's $2 a brick uh, that help build these restoration centers. I've said this a few times, I'm trying to remind us, how many street children are there in Jakarta? 40,000. There are 40,000 street children on the streets of the city of Jakarta, Senegal, Africa. So they're working with those street children to house them, to feed them, to clothe them, to educate them, and help them uh, in life. So last year we had a contest going on between the boys and the girls. So this is our grand total. So congratulations, boys. Good job, boys. You won the contest. <laughs> but I would like to point out that the girls really came up really quickly. They did. They did. They did a good job. But the real winner was we, yeah, we oh, hit we our goal, goal, which was amazing. <laughs> which is awesome. So thank you very much, and may you be blessed. And so we continue our MAC project. We're both at zero now. Yes. And so we will give you an update in February. All right, we're going to pray as we uh, prepare to worship the Lord in song. Let's pray together. God, we welcome you. We thank you that we have this time to praise you. We thank you that we have this measure of health and strength to be here today. And God, we come to draw close to you. We come to celebrate who, we, who you are. And God, we come to meet with you. So will you please fill our lives with your presence, with your power, Lord, with your purpose, that when we leave this place, God, we are energized, we are empowered, and we are strengthened by you, our Savior, that we would live for you, for your glory, for your honor, God, for your pleasure. Have your way in every aspect of this gathering. Do what you want. We surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Which means God do it. We come together. At this time, Pastor Andrea is going to come and lead us in worship. God bless you. 
is our prize, drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes it breaks. Father, that we don't have to look for you because you're right there. You are truly amazing. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Wanted to give you a little update from the Weirds. Today is our second Sunday, so we all need to highlight our missionaries. They are in the Dominican Republic. And for those of you who don't know, Heather was my roommate in Bible College. So I know a little bit about her. <laughs> So they sent this newsletter out, and she said, we wanted to share a few words of encouragement and report on what God is doing here in the Dominican Republic. And it says in Acts 16.5, and the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew in number every day. And they said, our Everyday Ministries Canada team has operated with this verse as our heartbeat for the last 18 years. We praise God for what he's doing in his church on the island of Hispaniola. We are continuing to resource the Evangelical Church, which is more than 18 denominations and movements, through teaching programs, preaching, leadership conferences, Bible college, community development programs, our family ministry center programs, child sponsorship, and much more. Listen, we have so much to be celebrate and thank God for this past year, from the opening and dedication of our ministry development center facility for conferences and hosting teams, to their second ever Bible college graduation. They did an expansion to the Girls of Destiny program to other parts of the island and overseas to Columbia, to the completion of Phase 3 renovations on our urban ministry facility. And that hosts their family ministries, national offices, and Bible colleges. Two, over 15 Canadian church teams and volunteer groups that minister in the Dominican Republic with them, to the launch of their high school ministry program, pregnancy and parenting classes, and over 500 pastors and leaders trained in their Fire in My Bones conferences. They had a busy year. Yeah. <laughs> they are very much excited for 2024 and specifically are looking to expand, imagine that, our training of pastors and leaders through our formal seminary and non-formal mobile Bible training programs. They're planning to implement their evangelistic empowering high school talks in many more schools in 2024 and continue to offer free counseling by a licensed psychologist in the family center. <laughs> We look forward to enrolling new students into the Bible College and forming partnerships with world churches in the areas of training, evangelism, and church building. Their hearts, they say, burst with all the areas we want to minister into strengthen Christ's church and see it grow daily in maturity 
and the souls being added to the kingdom. They are one of the missionaries that you are praying for and supporting financially, and they'd like to say thank you very much. And we're hoping this is a general year, a general conference year, so all of our missionaries are coming back to Canada, and so they are hoping to come this fall, so we hope to see them. Marlene, can I get you to pray for the DeWeers? Father God, we praise you and thank you for the of missionaries, this DeWeer family, Lord. We pray for their protection, Lord God, and we pray, Father God, that you continue to direct them in paths that they may not even be thinking of at this point. Lord, help it all be for your glory. Father, we pray that you will open the doors wide that need to be opened. You will shut any doors, Lord God, that need to be shut. We pray, Father God, that you will continue to support them, that they will be they will be astonished, Lord God, by what you're going to bring forth this year. And Father, we ask that you keep them healthy, you keep them growing in wisdom and strength. And Father, we ask that this be all done for your glory. In Jesus' name. At this time, we're going to dismiss our children to their ministry. God bless you, children, ministry workers, parents, and guardians. Uh, parents and guardians, you need to go downstairs and sign in your kids to the program. And then don't forget to pick them up afterward. God bless you, children, ministry, kids, workers, all we got. I'm going to ask you if you're physically able to, will you stand one more time together? And we're going to have a quick little meet and greet time. So if you can just move around and say hello to each other if you feel comfortable. If you don't, just wave. If you don't want to be in everybody's face, but let's say hello to each other for a few minutes. I also forgot to mention, sorry, uh, if you have cash or check donations and you want to, that was the perfect time for you to get your cash or check donations to the donation bin. You can certainly do that afterwards as well. The bin will be there a whole time together. You can also do them, of course, electronically anytime. So, Pastor Andrea, come on over. She's going to help me today with our verbal uh, reminders. In case you weren't here last week, you didn't hear the word, Pastor Andrea is a Bible College intern uh, that's studying through Kingswood University in Sussex, New Brunswick. She's originally from Glad Tidings of Moncton, our sister church, and so we're so glad she'll be here for almost four months. It's just shy of four months that she's helping us with ministry and learning and training. She's kind of job shadowing Pastor Laura and I. Thankfully, Pastor Laura is your direct supervisor, so you've got it made. You don't have to work only solely with me, but uh, we're, we're having fun as we learn. One week now, it's like 13 more to go or something like that. So we do welcome you all to Calvary Temple Church today. We're glad that you're here. want to encourage you, if you're here for the first time today, uh, you can text the, the word visitor to our church phone number, the main uh, first uh, office line. It's 506-634-1688. Just text the word visitor there. You'll get more info about us. We can get to know you. You can get to know us. And Pastor Andrea, what is an informational hub of our church? 
What is it? Website! The website! Yes! This is sparkling. She said to me, is this something we're going to practice or plan? I said, nope. We're just going to do it. We're just going to do it. That's how we roll. So please see our website, www.calvarytemplesk.com. That's where all of the info is about our church. We update that regularly, and that way you know what's going on in our church. I'm going to just remind you, or Pastor Andrew and I are going to remind you of six Quick things that we really don't want you to forget. Number one, want to remind you that today is beginning our annual uh, first part of the year week of prayer. So we're beginning this time starting today. There is a sign-up sheet that Sue has that yeah, you can just send that right through. Start at the back there and send it up through. There's going to be a clipboard come through. And we encourage you to sign in to pray for a particular time slot starting today. And if the time has already passed, that's okay. And then all the rest of this week through until the end of this week on Saturday, you're committing to pray Three in the morning for an hour, all week long, or a half an hour. I can't remember if it's set an hour, a half hour blocks. I can't remember, but half hour. Sign in for one or two or three or however many you want of those time blocks. And we're praying for our church. We're praying for God's will to be done in this assembly and praying for the future that he has. So please join us if you can to pray. And we're hoping maybe Pastor Andrea and I, Pastor Laura, may be working on some online content this week. Maybe that will also show up on our online feeds that you can participate in. Hopefully, that was a long one. Number two, I'm going to ask Pastor Andrea. Pastor Andrea, what are you doing this evening? Well, um, starting at 6 p.m. tonight, there will be an online Bible discussion group on Zoom with Pastor Chad. And we're going to be exploring trustworthy, overcoming our greatest struggles to trust God. We're looking at First and Second Kings from the Bible with Lisa Turkers. Um, and if you want to purchase a study guide for yourself, you can do so on Amazon about today. That's it. So please join in tonight. If you don't get our weekly emails, let us know. Send me a message. Find me. Just let me know. And we'll give you that access code that you need to go on online tonight. It does use the Zoom app. Uh, hopefully you can join in tonight. It's going to be a great time as we just discuss together uh, these things from God's Word, these principles. Number three, everyone help me out. What's happening here tomorrow? Prayer. Our Monday prayer time, we meet at 1 o'clock in the cafe area right back there, and we'd love for you to join in if you can for this in-person prayer time as we are a part of the fuel that God uses to move the church forward. Number four, what's happening in the life of this church this Wednesday night? And I need Sue Tudor for this. Sue, will you come on up and help me? What's happening Wednesday night? There you go. Sue's coming. She's coming. She's juggling clipboards and everything. So 7 o'clock. This Wednesday, we have the Zoom, WM Zoom meeting. If I don't already have your email address and you don't get my email and you would like it, please see me afterwards. I will get your email and I will send out the Zoom code for you. We would love to see as many people as possible. Our very own Cindy McGuire is speaking this Sunday. This Wednesday. So we're continuing our series on the seven churches of Revelation. Should be a really good meeting. So. Awesome. Good stuff. Sydney, did you want to speak today? Because you can. No? Okay. All right. Because if you want me, you can. I uh, want you all to help me. Now, we're going to help Pastor Andrew. She's new here. And so she needs a little help. So you're going to tell her what is happening this Thursday here at Calvert Temple. Hey. And what is that? There we go. Okay, good stuff. So the doors open. If you're interested in attending, we welcome you to do so. The doors open at 1120. And at uh, 12 o'clock we get started, or 12.05, and we have an inspirational message. Someone shares a little devotional or a life story, and then we have our hot meal together that's served right here, prepared here and served here. And then we also have bags of groceries that are handed out, and there's times of encouragement, times of prayer, times of just, just celebration together. I call it basically a community lunch. We all just come together right here and have lunch together, and it's a wonderful time. So we encourage you to come and attend. If you if you want to have lunch, uh, come join us, and it'll be a great time together. And I want to say thank you to all of you who graciously serve and donate. There are two donation tables in here I want to remind you of, because we're not in the sanctuary right now. There's one table back there with an orange flyer around it there, and that's for KE donations. And then behind Sue, there's a green banner, and that poster and table is for the pantry food donations. And you graciously... Every week, bring items that help us. In fact, Pastor Andrea, what is our item for the month of February that we're bringing in uh, in the next couple of weeks? 
jam. So we need a hundred jars of jam to bless our front pantry ministry guests. That's right. Do you think we can bring in a hundred? Yeah. Yes. I know we can. You're always so faithful, and we appreciate that. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Angie. I appreciate, appreciate your help and me embarrassing you a little bit as well. You're a good sport. Um, we do uh, appreciate all of you folks, and I want to remind you again, you can give financially through cash or check donations in the donation box here or anytime electronically. Please see our website. We have a giving page on our website, and you can participate uh, on there as well and give any time at all. It is my privilege to be able to minister today in preaching the Word of God. And so we're, we're going to prepare to do that. But I want to tell you this little story very quickly. An elderly woman walked into a church one Sunday morning. The friendly usher greeted her when she came in the door and helped her up the flight of stairs. It must have been the blue room at Calvary Temple. Where would you like to sit? He asked politely. And she says, oh, the front row, please. Oh, the usher says, you, you, you really don't want to do that. The pastor is really boring. The woman says, excuse me, do you happen to know who I am? He said, no. She said very indignantly, I'm the pastor's mother. He said, well, do you know who I am? And she said, no. And he said, good. And then he walked away. <laughs> Today we're continuing our Sunday morning teaching series that we began last week. And through the winter time, we're going to be walking together through the blueprints of the church. I, I had these last week and I'll haul them out again. And actually, I'm sorry, Pastor Andrew, I'm picking on you so much. Can you open this up for me to the full extended big old? And once you get it, if you can set it here on the stage for me, that'd be great. We want to dig into the blueprints of the church. These are actual blueprints of Calvary Temple. It's only a part of the domain, but these are actual blueprints. We want to dig into the blueprints of the church. What is God's plan for the church? Now, we're not going to look at engineering documents. We're going to look at God's engineering document. We're going to look at the book of Acts. If you have your Bible or your Bible app today, we're going to look in there in a few minutes. We want to dig into the Word of God and see what is God's desire for the church. How should the church best function? As we examine our biblical foundational roots, we understand better who and what we're supposed to be. I don't want to get off track this early because we'll be doomed, but I'm just going to say there's a lot of confusion in North America today about the church. I love when people say, oh, I don't know they like that church. That church is blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, church needs to be blah, blah, blah. You know what church needs to be and should be? It's right here. It's right here, folks. Uh, I don't want to get too far off track because we'll be in trouble, but it ain't a rock concert. Church is not all about what it can do just for me that I am... am, 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 am somehow entertained or appeased. We need to go back to our roots. So today we're going to dig into the Word of God and we're going to look at the proclamation of the church. What is the, the job of the proclamation of the church? What does the Bible say about this? I want to remind you, we have some teaching note pages right here on the side. If you're interested, you can grab one of those or there's some at the back as well or on our website. That way you don't fall asleep because it's really awkward when I have to come and wake you up. It's difficult, and you might hit your head, and it's just tough. So please take one of those teaching note pages. That way you can follow along. I'm going to ask Elizabeth if she would read our Bible text for today's teaching. Uh, do you want me to come to you? Do you want to come up? Or what you want? Okay. Elizabeth's going to read the, the text. It's found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. Here we go. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames and tongues of fire appeared, and suddenly and settled on each of them. And everyone presented present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time there were devoted Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believer. They were completely amazed. How could this be? They explained. These people are all from Galilee, and yet here they, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are. Here are these. Midis, Eliamites, people from Medidotes, Siam, Judah, 
Cappadocia, Pontus, and other and provinces of Asia. Perge, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Surrey. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages of the, the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd relaxed with them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stood, stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jew, Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Not what you know. What you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. And in these days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike. And they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red. Before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorses Jesus, the Nazareth, and by and by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and he prearranged plan to carry out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to the cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grips. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is life-giving. We thank you that your word is instructional. We thank you that your word changes us, God. Speak to us today from your word, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. The disciples were people who had been called by God to follow from their chosen professions to follow Jesus. They would have left it all. It must have seemed to them like Jesus, when he was crucified on the cross, they lost everything. They gave up everything and followed Jesus, but now he was dead. It was all for naught. What a waste. Following the admonition of their Lord, whom they saw disappear in the clouds, we talked about that last Sunday, they returned to the place of danger, Jerusalem. Jesus told them that they should stay there until they received something called the Holy Spirit who would come and fill them with power from heaven. Luke 24 to 49 and Acts 1 4. So they made their way to the upper room, where not long before they heard Jesus say, as recorded in John 14, 1, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, he said. It was this was the room where he had promised he was going to send another comforter, someone to stand alongside of them. In John 14, 16, in the New Living Translation, it records, Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Or the biblical Greek says a paraclete, meaning a comforter, an encourager, a counselor, who will never leave you. Boy, that's encouraging. This very upper room, this is the same place where Jesus had promised them a peace that the world was totally ignorant of. John 14, 27, Jesus said, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or don't be afraid. I just want to interject here really quick before I forget. Boy, our world today tries to fill our lives with that peace. Some of us try to find it in a liquid or a bottle or a, or a, or a, or a, or a, or a, or a 
substance of some kind. Some of us find it in other people. Some of us find it in being busy. We say busy, 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 we're on a hamster wheel. Busy, 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 that'll solve that, that void within me. But Jesus says, I give a gift of peace that the world cannot give. It's only found in me, Jesus says. It was in this very same upper room that Jesus appeared to the frightened disciples following his resurrection to satisfy the curiosity of Thomas the doubter who proclaimed at that, moment, at that very moment when he saw the nail scars with his own eyes, my Lord and my God, John 20, 28. So the disciples returned to Jerusalem to that very same upper room to receive power. But the question must have been in their minds, power, power for what? What did they have to receive power for? What was the church to do? The Lord said that they were to be eyewitnesses. But what were they to be witnesses of? What were they to witness about? The Jewish celebration of Passover was a time when their questions would be answered. Pentecost was a celebration where the Hebrews came and gave thanks to God for the grain harvest and remembered the giving of the law through Moses. Pentecost was a time of great crowds in Jewish, in Jewish history because the Jews living in other parts of the world chose to come to the Pentecost celebration rather than the Passover because the traveling weather was much better for the time of Pentecost. In many respects, Pentecost was the Tower of Babel experience in reverse. I've never thought of this before. But Pentecost, as we read it in Book of Acts, was a Tower of Babel experience in reverse. At Babel, people's pride brought God's judgment and their tongues, their language was confused. At Pentecost, the miracle seemed reversed as the confusion of the world was suddenly clarified by the message of God heard in languages that they all could understand. Think about it. God performed a great miracle of communication that frankly was just plain bizarre. As the disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in other languages or tongues, unlearned, non-mother tongue dialects. Check it out. Look at this. Acts 2, verse 6. You have it there in your Bible, your Bible app. By the way, I forgot to say, we have some Bibles up here. If you want to follow along in a Bible, the print isn't like font 2, so you might be able to see it. Yep, one there. Do I have any other takers? It's good for you to have a Bible because the Bible says that I can preach anything at all if you aren't looking it up yourself. Anybody else want a printed Bible to use today? They're going at a pretty good price. Anybody else want one to use today? Anybody else? I've got to keep preaching before we stay until lunchtime or after. Anybody else? Come on, somebody's got to take this. Otherwise, I'm just going to wander around with it all day. Thank you. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, when they heard the loud noise... Everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages spoken by the believers. Did you catch that? Did you catch that, friends? Every person present heard their own vernacular, their own language, their own dialect. That's amazing. In this experience right here in the Bible, we see two primary questions that hint to the purposes of the church and its witness by proclamation. Now, I've got some good news and bad news. The good news is I love you. The bad news is that was the introduction. Here we go into the main points. Blueprint for the church. Witness by proclamation. Question number one. I got two questions today. Question number one. Why proclaim? Why does the church need to proclaim? Why does the church need to be about proclamation? We find it in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. And generally, when you think about this, in the Old Testament, the Israelites generally did not convert outsiders to their faith of Yahwehism or the precursor to Judaism. This was the exception uh, when we think about Jonah. Jonah had a mission in Nineveh. The Old Testament indicates the Israelites felt their position was to be an example to the world, but not a converter of the world en masse. And today, in our world, 2024... As some of the older and supposedly more sophisticated Christian denominations and churches think, they're, they're beginning to shy away from the kind of preaching that we see here in Acts chapter 2 by Peter. But I challenge that we need to hear more of Peter's explanation of who Jesus is and what he's all about. So why do we proclaim? Well, first off, because of divine will. 
because of divine will. Simon Peter stood up on Acts 2, that Pentecost day, and he explained what was happening by affirming the fulfillment of the prophecy of the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. He declared that the time would come when young and old would voice the message of God. It wouldn't only be select prophets. It wouldn't only be select people. It would be everyone, the whosoever will, who were open to the Lord. It was God's perfect plan all along. Why else proclaim? Because of the Holy Spirit's coming. Because of the Holy Spirit's coming. We find the coming of the Holy Spirit does two things with regard to the work of the church. First off, the Holy Spirit comes to empower and inspire a person's witness. I said it last week and I'll say it again. We can get really confused in Pentecostalism. We can get really excited. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm the most excitable person you ever met. I can dance all over your head in two seconds. I get real fired up, real excited. I have a very short emotional uh, straw. It just goes. I'm just all wound up all the time. Where's There she is. God bless you. I love you. Every Sunday I have one person say to me, how wound up are you today? But can I tell you, that isn't... What God calls us to be is just wound up. Now, if you're like me and you're very expressive and emotional and you love Jesus, that's lovely. What he's called us to is witness. In Pentecostalism, we can sometimes mix up the excitement, the joy, the worship, and say that's all that it is. Pentecostalism is all about just being fired up, excited, and hyper, and happy, and having a good, a good worship service. You know, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. I pray that God gives us more bad worship services because when I go home and say, that wasn't a good service, it's because I'm convinced of sin. It's because the Holy Spirit says, hey, dummy, you need to stop doing that. I want to get into every area of your life. I want to get into your tongue. I want to get into your pocketbook. I want to revolutionize your life for this world with no me. Getting a little off track, I'm sorry. The purpose of the Holy Spirit's coming was to empower the church for witness. Acts 2 says, when the day of Pentecost came, all the believers gathered in one place. Suddenly a crashing sound came from heaven. It was like a strong wind blowing. Boy, it reminds me of yesterday. I thought my trees were just going to lay down on the ground with all that wind yesterday. The whole house was filled where they were sitting. Something that looked like fire in the shape of tongues came and separated and rested on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth read earlier. They began to speak in languages they had not learned before. And the Spirit gave them the ability to do this. They were proclaiming God. They were admitting who Jesus was. Luke describes the coming of the Holy Spirit as flames. Now that's really interesting. Because fire, when you think about fire, fire purifies. The gospel message Purifies When the people of God live the gospel message out, when the people of God share the gospel message, the truth of Jesus, there is purification that happens. All falsehood is burned up before the Lord. The fact that every person heard this message from God in their own dialect is an indication that the gospel is for all the world, for all people. The coming of the Holy Spirit was to bring power primarily for witnessing. God did not give us the Holy Spirit to make us feel good. He came to make us courageous in the battle for people's souls. Hello? The battle for people's souls. I'm going to be honest, friends. I'm going to be really honest. I said to somebody this week, and I can't remember who it was. Oh, now I do. I was meeting with someone. Jesus said that the enemy comes in John 10, 10 to do three things. What are they? Steal, kill, and destroy. Those are three tools he uses. He really literally does that. It's not just words that Jesus just, oh, blah, blah, blah. No, no. Stealing is what the enemy does. Killing is what the enemy does. And destroying is what he does. But Jesus said, I have come to bring abundant life. What's my point? Satan wants you dead. Satan wants your family dead and in hell. Satan wants your neighbors dead and in hell. Satan wants your your, your co-workers dead and in hell. Satan wants anybody that you meet, that person at the grocery store, the steps on your foot, and you're ready to plow them. Satan wants them dead. We're to be witnesses. We're to be witnesses for the Lord. It's a battle for souls. We can get offended. We can get all fired up and annoyed. Why did they do that? Why did they say that? Well, they're sinners. Of course they're going to sin. We need to be witnesses. We need to be witnesses for the Lord. 
Those faulty, supposed Christians who sadly have no desire to witness for Jesus don't need to pray for a great manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Because the whole purpose of God moving and working is that we'll get out of here and be witnesses for Him. I need to stay on track because we're going to be here all day. But I feel prompted of the Holy Spirit to say it again. I've said this a bunch of times. When my wife worked in retail, do you know who the nastiest people were that went to the bookstore? The Christians on Sunday that went in after church to buy a Bible. Straight up. It's her experience. It's what she found. Her co-workers would come and say, can you go help them, Laura? Because it's so stupid, nasty Christians. And they're telling me off. I'm going to punch them in the face. Will you go deal with them? She's like, okay. She goes, they're going to buy a Bible after church. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. That you would truly get a hold of our whole lives, our actions, our reactions, that we would live wholeheartedly for him. Remind me again, why do we proclaim Jesus as Savior? Why? Why do you bother to share Jesus? Why? Jason, why should we share Christ with those around us? Why? Okay. Sure. What, Marlene? Why should we share Christ with anyone around us in our life? Okay? Sure. It's the impetus, I believe, of being a Christ follower. He drives that within us. He sparks that within us. He rises it up. If we have our heart open to Him and we're really following Him, He'll nudge you. Hey, pray for them. Hey, love them. Hey, care about them. Hey, listen to them. The Holy Spirit as well also convicts the unsaved. How did people respond to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2? What was the response? Look, look it up yourself. It's right there. Acts chapter 2. I'll give you a hand. Verse 37. What, 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 what happened? How did they respond? What does it say? Somebody better have the Bible. Acts 2.37. What does it say? That's it. That's it. Their hearts were pierced. Their hearts were pricked. The response was, what should we do? What a beautiful response. Don't you love that, Pastor O'Connor? When you preach the Word of God, and the, and the audience's response, it doesn't have to be verbally, but the audience's response is hard is, what should we do? How can we live this? How can we live this out? How can we do what God wants us to do? What a beautiful response. Peter's words. God used those words. And it's interesting, in the biblical Greek, the word actually used right here, that pierced or prick, it's actually one to depict the sting of a hornet. These people were stung in their hearts by the Holy Spirit's power in conviction. We find the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit in regard to the unsaved world is indeed to convince of sin. But the work of Christ... Is very complex and very far reaching. The Lord comes to empower us, those who have responded to Him, to serve as witnesses for Him as He also convinces of sin in hearts and lives. The coming of Jesus made God's revelation far reaching, wide reaching, and very tangible. The message had come in powerful, dynamic, dynamic ways. And God's spiritual presence was there to convince the world that this was truly God's personal salvation message for them. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 says, Long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to the ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, He has spoken to us through His Son, God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. I want to encourage you today, friends, that there is never going to be any other revelation of Jesus Christ. It's found in the Word of God. This is that Jesus is the only revelation we need, the Word of God. So Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, uh, Mary uh, Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, were completely false when they said they had another, further revelation of Jesus. Jesus alone is the latest and fullest message of God to humanity. Why else do we proclaim Jesus as Savior? Well, because the world needs salvation. That's not popular to say today, but it's true. The world needs salvation. I need salvation. You do. Here again we see God's intent. Look at Acts 2 verse 21. Acts 2 verse 21. 
Acts 2, verse 21. Somebody shout it out. Acts 2, verse 21. What does it read? What does it say? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's a couple of things that excite me there. I could preach on this verse for another three hours. But I won't. I won't. I promise, Harvey. I won't. But listen to me. Everyone is excited. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. The second thing that really excites me is they will be saved. They will be rescued. They will be redeemed. They will be snatched. Peter says, even as if from the flames of hell... Don't forget the whole point, folks. If we forget about forgetting the blueprints of the church, if we forget the biblical principles, we forget about the divine will of God as expressed in prophecy, if we forget about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the purpose that He came for, if we forget that the whole world needs salvation or else they will go to eternal punishment called hell, then there's no point in worrying about the proclamation of the gospel. But friends, today I want to encourage you, if we don't avoid and neglect God's will, if we don't avoid and neglect and forget the coming of the Holy Spirit, if we don't forget the fact that this world is lost, then we must do everything possible to bring everyone to Jesus Christ. Amen? Blueprint of the church witnessed by proclamation. Question number two. Oh good, we're halfway through. What preaching? What preaching? What exactly is the message that the church has for the lost world around us? I believe there's two aspects of the church's message that we find in Acts chapter 2, specifically in verses 24 through 36. One aspect of the church's message comes out of the other. The primary message concerns the coming of God in Christ and his death on the cross for our sins. This is the message to the unsaved world. Jesus is Savior. You don't have to live in your sin. You don't have to live in your shame. You don't have to live in your wrong. You don't have to live addicted to sin. You can be forgiven by Jesus. Out of this message comes the te teaching of the church concerning what a Christian ought to be once they've accepted Christ as Savior. Though these two make up the single message of the kingdom of God, they are, are distinctive in nature. Some religious groups today in our world fail to see that the gospel includes both aspects. The basic word in the New Testament concerning the message of the church to the lost in the biblical Greek, and Pastor Andrew would have studied this not long ago, is the kerygma. The kerygma, the kerygma concerns the basic elements of the gospel, a person coming to know Jesus as Savior. And once someone has come to that point and opened their life to God, they're not done. The work isn't done, then begins the second aspect, and that's in the New Testament known as in a biblical Greek word, the didache, which literally means the teaching. Some churches today skip the kerygma, the proclamation, the clear announcing, Jesus is coming! You need Jesus! They skip the proclamation part and think, oh, we'll just do a nice teaching. Jesus is a beautiful teacher. Jesus is a lovely historical. He's a nice person. Then if we, you know, we think about him and, okay, let's go home. I don't want to put anyone down. I don't want to be extra nasty. I'm not trying to pick on anyone. But friends, today, we cannot overlook the need of conversion in our hearts and lives. We must not only teach people how to live nice principles and good ideals. We must have at the heart the reality that we need Jesus Christ as Savior and we need to be grown into a disciple of Him, a follower of Jesus. I don't know about you, but for me it's a full-time job. For me it's an everyday kind of thing. He convinces me of sin. He reminds me. He corrects me. He stops me. He says, hey, that's a wrong attitude. That's a bad attitude. I was talking to Brad at the back home probably two weeks ago and I was joking around and said something and you don't even know this, but I got home and the Holy Spirit said, you shouldn't have said that. He's working on me. That's the process, friends. It's not a, oh, I'm a rock. I pray prayer. It's 1962 on a Saturday morning at 6. I'm good. I'm done. Going to heaven. I'm done. I'm perfect. <laughs> no. God, help us. No. A little boy said one day to his dad, Dad, did Grandpa make you to go to church and Sunday school when you were my age? His father said, he sure did. We went every Sunday. The little boy said sadly, well, I bet it won't do me any good either. <laughs> you see, my friend, today, it's not enough to just go to church. I used to say this in youth group almost every week in Yarmouth when I was on staff as youth pastor. If I go to Tim Hortons every day of the week, 
And I get a donut. And I espouse to be a donut. I might even look a little bit like one. But I won't be a donut. I won't be a donut. If you go to church every day of your life, you can be here 12 hours a day. You will not be a Christian. It's a heart thing that we need to surrender to God and respond to Him and let Him in our lives and allow Him to be our Savior, friends. Oh, I'm going to have to move along. I'm going to be here all day. I'm just trying to skip some stuff. We must carefully look at the content of Peter's sermon. <laughs> this is fun. I'll say this. You see it? Acts 2.40 specifically says that Peter continued preaching for a long time. Oh, there's hope for me. There's hope for me. He strongly urged all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Even in the summary of the sermon that Peter shared in Acts 2, we still find the basic elements of what must make up the proclamation of Jesus is Savior. That proclamation is found foundationally. What is the gospel made up of? I'm going to ask you. You help me in. I'm going to sleep the whole morning. Come on now. What is the gospel made up of? What components? What do you need to share when you're trying to share the gospel? What is it? Tell me. What is it about? Repentance. Yes, repentance. Yeah, what else? The love of God. Yeah. What else? Obedience. Sure. Who is it about? Yeah, Jesus, his sacrifice. Yes, exactly. There's key components that must be shared. We see even in Peter's sermon, in Acts chapter 2, look at it. He, he shares in verse 22 about the life of Jesus. The good news that we share as the church is about the life of Jesus. Secondly, it affirms that the crucifixion of Christ was part of God's redemptive plan. Thirdly, it also confirms the resurrection of Jesus, that he triumphed over death and sin. He's alive. He's powerful. He's still working today. And that victorious power is real. I told Mikey that when we met for supper on Thursday night. He is real. He's real. As well, it verifies the lordship of Jesus Christ. I forgot the verses. I'm sorry. 22, 23, 24. In verse 36, we see the lordship of Jesus in Peter's sermon. And also, lastly, it attests the forgiveness found in Jesus alone. Acts 2, 38. Any preaching, friends, any living as a Christian, any talk out of a Christian life that does not cover these essential components of the message of the gospel is not truly Christ-honoring. We find over and over and over and over again in the book of Acts, we see it listed, these components, faith in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, his power at work, the lordship of Jesus, and the forgiveness possible for sins from Christ and Christ alone. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back now. The scriptures remind us that there's something else besides only what we see in the natural that makes success in the Christian life. I love those church growth experts. I said, oh, you want to see your church grow? You need to get one of those newfangled smoke machines. You got to get the extra large unit that really fills the place. It'll look like a foggy day. Or you need to do that new program called XYZ. Everybody stands on the right foot for three and a half hours on Saturday morning. Your church will grow. <coughs> no, friends. Do you know what it is that makes my life go in the Lord? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit of God driving me, empowering me, correcting me, leading me. We desperately need the power of God actively at work in our daily lives, friends. It is in living and breathing while being the church that we see God do amazing things and we have God interruptions. Things that would shock us. Things that we didn't even expect or imagine or dream. God shows up and does because He's God and we're open to Him. If we become too comfortable in our own way of life, we can forget the needs of the world and we can begin to not be able to respond adequately to the needs in lives because we forget our purpose. We forget it's all about the Lord. It's all about Him speaking in us and through us and moving through victory in and through our lives. Just as an airport 
can get fogged in and the planes cannot arrive into the airport so our lives can sometimes get so clouded and clogged up with so many other things. Our spirit becomes cluttered up and the entrance of God's power is nearly impossible. So we as the church, may we always remember that we are to live in God's power, to walk in His power, to be open to His moving and to proclaim Jesus as Savior. May we be that May we do that. This morning, if you would like to this prayer, you would say, yeah, I, I need to be a proclaimer of God. I need God's power. I need God's deliverance. I need God's help. doesn't matter what it's for. Maybe it's something physical. Maybe it's something mental, emotional, spiritual. Whatever it is, we'd like to pray with you. And I encourage you, as the worship team leads us in these next worship songs, this is a time to just press into the Lord. Please don't leave. Don't rush. Don't run away. Stay here. And let's just come together and pray. If you need prayer for anything, I'd like to pray for you today. So let, let's just press into the Lord. Let's press into the Lord together. Thank mm-hmm. you.